This is the DMT One to One Show, episode four, recorded on the fifth of April, twenty thirteen. An interview with Sart Calhoun on the Book of Sart and Marnie Wantner from Sneak Attack Media, discussing some of the projects they've been involved in. So oh, it's uh, the DMT One to One Show, and it's great today to have on the show uh, artist uh, Sart Calhoun. Uh, so hi, Sart, and great to have you on. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? Great, thank you. And also we're going to have on the show uh, Marnie uh, Wandner uh, from um, uh, Sneak Attack Media. And uh, she's going to be in the background for the first part of the, of the show. She might, uh, she might uh, um, say a couple of things, but uh, we're going to do a bit, bit of a more uh, comprehensive chat with her uh, later on. Uh, so uh, great, let's, uh, let's start by talking about uh, your work, Arthur. So first of all, uh, you know, would, you, would you care to let people know, you know what you've been working on uh, before and, and what's your history music-wise? Um, so I'm working, uh, I recently released this uh, project called the book of Sarth, yeah. which is, um, an interactive record slash music video slash iPad app. Awesome. So it's like an immersive experience that you, um, buy onto your iPad and then you can see the art and the music together. Yeah. Yeah. It's and great. It's I, pretty I, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I, I've, I've played with it quite a bit, and uh, you know, it, it shows a really deep bond between the music and the visuals. So, how did you go about um, creating it? Did you have uh, music that you wanted to set uh, alongside it, or did you did you uh, do both at the same time, sort of hand in hand? So it did start from the music. Um, obviously, the music changed as the art ch changed, and it was a very collaborative process between yeah. me and the artist Alex Smith, who's like really a brilliant artist, and um, a lot of the. The whole story and the whole idea of the book all came from the artist. So really, I just had this music, and I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could put art with this music and do something like that? And we could maybe we could put it on the iPad, and we could sell it this way as a package. And I just imagined like an abstract piece. But uh, I, the artist was the guy who really generated the fact that we should have a story, the fact that we should have characters. You know, the whole sort of shape of it came from him. All I had was a title yeah. and some rough tracks. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And so, so the, 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 you know, the, the book, the, the story is set in a dystopian future where there is no music, which is, you know, of course, intriguing for, for a music app. And, and the whole thing stems from that, from that idea. So, you know, was there anything uh, in particular that uh, led uh, you or the artist to go in, in the direction of the dystopian future where there is no music? Uh, do, do you believe oh, this? Of course. Yeah. Of course. I mean, the entire book of Sarth, I mean, I, th I think you're, you're picking up on that, or I'm hoping you are by asking that question, is a metaphor for what I see happening with music and the music industry. Because I think that one of the things that we can't conceive of is the fact that art forms come and go. And we think whatever we see as being art now will always be available to us. But that's not true. Actually, recorded music has had a heyday, and that heyday has been maybe, let's, let's say arbitrarily, the 50s, the 40s. I don't know when you would say it started. And then it peaked probably in the 70s and 80s. And it's had its sort of burst in the 90s, you know, as things always do, the crest of the wave. And then it's been declining. And all mediums go through this. Yeah. You know, there, there'll, there'll be a a heyday for painting, there'll be a heyday for film, there'll be a heyday, right now we're in the heyday for TV, right? Like you see the coolest TV shows that we've ever seen. Yeah. So I think that music, just re pure recorded music, we've already seen sort of the peak of that. And if we don't create a new infrastructure for people to sell music and to make money from music, then the art form as we know it will change enough that you could say it's gone away. Yeah. And you're already seeing that. And, and by definition, when you change an art form to be supported by advertising, which is a lot of the suggestions, or music licensing, or anything like that, you fundamentally change the art form, yeah. and you change the art form forever. You saw that with newspapers, when newspapers, and Noam Chomsky talks about that in Manufacturing Consent, when you see newspapers that went from being subscription-based and people paying for the newspaper to newspapers that got their revenue from advertising. You see a radical change in the nature of what is reported and how it's reported. Yeah. So you, you're going to you're seeing that with music already too. Yeah, and and do you feel like there that the artist has a needs uh, like you did, for example, with the, with this app, needs to look beyond uh, just the music and try and create something that really compels people to buy the whole the whole concept, the whole idea. Is, is there a Absolutely. need for that? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I think all music 
that we know has always been sold that way. We're just not that conscious of it. So whether it's being sold by, hi, I'm a cool guy and I wear sunglasses and I get all the chicks or whatever, there's always a context and a whole story that goes around the music. So what you know, what the mobile devices and what the, the multimedia is giving us is a chance to get really creative with what that story is. So instead of there just being a limited couple of narratives that you could sort of explain your music with, now there's, there's whole worlds of ways that you can explain and contextualize your music. And, and th that's always been part of music and it always will be. Yeah. You know, music is very ethereal, right? I mean, it's very abstract. It's the most abstract art form. So people have always latched into other parts in order to understand it and enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, looking at how you're, you know, t technically, of course, you're coming from a musician's background. Of course, you, you worked a lot on electronics as well. So, of course, you, you got like a, a lot of, you know, education on that front. But how, how did, how was, uh, how daunting was the process for you to uh, go about uh, creating this app with an artist? Of course, there's, there's got to be intermediaries that actually come in between and create the technology to get the app working together. Did you find that, how do you find the whole process? It was really hard. I mean, it was fun and it was wonderful and I love it and I'm going to keep working this way because it's one of the most satisfying things I've ever done in my entire life and I, I feel like I've found my obsession, like, you know, my real, the real medium I like to work in. That said, it was crazy hard. We thought we would do it in like six months and it took about two and a half years. Wow. We had a wonderful developer who he just killed himself, you know, and just worked nights and weekends and, you know, we agreed to a price that was completely inadequate and he stuck to it anyway. Andrew Beck, he's just, he's a prince and he's totally dedicated, but it was a huge process, you know, and I think there's that, that's the nature of interactive technology is that it's always a lot more complicated than you think it's going to be because it, it's factorial. You know, you change one thing and like a thousand things change. Yeah. And do you think that, that this uh, poses a, a barrier for a lot of people to get into this space? And, and, and do you believe there's going to be tools in the future that might facilitate uh, an easier way in f for these kind of processes? I, I believe it's a, an insurmountable barrier, which is why I developed this in the way that I did, so that other musicians can actually use the platform that I built in order to, to make my book of Sarth. So awesome. what I'm releasing now is the technology behind the book of Sarth can be used for other similar interactive pieces for musicians. So that's part of why it took so long, actually, is that we realized as we started doing it, hey, other musicians, other artists are going to want to do this, so we should build this with that in mind. And, and that, that made it a lot more complicated. If I had just been building the Book of Sarth as a one-off, we could have done it a lot more rapidly, but I, I, I wanted to make this infrastructure available to other people because I think that this is the future of how to experience art and music. And that becomes a super interesting as well for, for people that, that have that, that approach of, of collating visuals with, 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 uh, with music. And, uh, and of course, it, it makes it, it's really great because uh, you know, so many musicians find that the process of doing something like that, you know, the, the realm of uh, musicians like you know, Bjork that have really huge audiences and, and really deep pockets to, to actually get, go and develop this stuff. But, if, if, as you say, there is a chance of people being able to apply the same technology and not take two and a half years to, to get, to get uh, their own version of this out, then that's, that's an amazing opportunity for them, for sure. Yeah, I, th I mean, I hope so. I hope so, yeah, exactly. And so, um, in terms of sounds, you know, uh, just to, uh, geeking out a little bit on, on, on you know, how, how you, you create the music, uh, you know, I, I, what are your prim primary sort of go-to tools in terms of hardware and software to, to create your, your soundscapes and, 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 and your music? So it's pretty straightforward. I mean, uh, the, my primary instrument is the Continuum Fingerboard, which I love to death and I think is the future of expression through electronic controls, the Continuum Fingerboard or something like it. Yeah. And um, I, uh, for, in terms of to create like really intense sounds, I use a, a hardware accelerated DSP, like a DSP platform ca called Kima. It's, a, it's software that runs on DSP hardware. It's like Max on steroids. Yeah. It's used a lot for sound design and stuff. And so I love Kima to death, and I talk to those guys regularly, and we work on features and stuff like that. And then for like the basic like nuts and bolts, meat and potatoes kind of arranging stuff, I use Ableton Live. Yeah. And that's, that, that's most of my setup. And then I have some crazy things around my studio. Sure, I'm sure. And uh, you know, lo looking at the experience of, of the Book of Sarth, of course, it's a, it's a unique application, and it's, it's a combination of, of uh, music and visuals. Uh, as far as the music goes, uh, do you have plans of making that available uh, separately? and how is that side going to work? 
I am going to. I was I was debating it for a long time, but I think that obviously not everybody has an iOS device, and I would like the music to be more widely available. I think I'm going to do some slight remixes and make it available um, probably within the next few weeks through iTunes and directly from my website. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a so space? So I'll call it the Sarth transmissions, probably, or transmissions from the Book of Sarth. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And then, do you think there's a space for? A sort of more c c cinematic rendition of 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 the of the experience uh, for people that maybe don't have iOS devices, or because uh, of course the trailer is awesome. Uh, just in terms of giving a, a slightly longer look at how how the book works out. Well, you know, I did do a, a very small private launch party, like for friends, um, in Williamsburg in the fall, yeah. and we just played the book back as a as basically like a twenty eight minute movie or however long it is. I can't ever remember how long it is, but yeah. um. And we played it on three screens, and people could hang around, and then afterwards they could mess with the iPads. And um, you know, I was, I was actually surprised at how effective it was, just as a movie. You yeah. know, just watching it linearly. And um, I think I would be happy. I would like to do more live performances like that. And maybe at some point I can make some of some clips from it available as like YouTube videos sure. or whatever. But I, it does degrade the experience somewhat to watch it online. I, I think I don't know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's uh, absolutely great, and you know, I would recommend uh, uh, all the listeners of DNT to really go and check out the book of the book of Sarth on the App Store. It's available internationally, and uh, you know, for anybody that's interested in in this sort of exper experiments, it's it's an amazing book and uh, great music and great visuals. So, so thanks so much, for, uh, Sarth, for being on the show. Thank you. It's great. Okay, so uh, now we move on to the second part of, uh, of the same feature, but uh, talking to Marnie Wandner, uh, who is the president of Sneak Attack Media, uh, who has been involved in, in a number of uh, different projects uh, related to music, and uh, you know, the Book of Sarth is one of them, and also uh, a number of other things that we're going to talk about uh, in this uh, little chat. So hi Marnie, and great to have you on, how's it going? Hi, good to see you. Great, so it was a great chat with, uh, with uh, Sarth, and so I just wanted to ask you a bit of a follow-up on the, on the book of Sarth. Uh, what was uh, Sneak Attack's involvement in, 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 in the process, and um, how did you help out? Uh, we just sort of started scratching the surface a bit, because the first, um, the first idea was sort of to approach the uh, you know, tech websites about, about what's going on on the technical side of the app. And now I think we're going to move into kind of the more of the music side because I think it's a little bit it's it's so interesting that it's a music project but it's an app and there's a lot lot going on in that space but I don't think that I've ever seen something quite like this so we're we're uh, really interested to see just what the music side of, of the uh, of the blog world has to say about it and yeah. I think it'll be really interesting yeah because of course you know we're all familiar with the the, the billions of vanity apps that are out there but there's very few uh, creative uh, projects uh, like this one that actually take an app form, because like, like Sarth mentioned, you know, it's it's a very daunting process for any musician to embark, embark in, and uh, especially if you know if they don't have you know, huge budgets to work with. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's um, it's amazing that he you know was able to create this. It's not surprising that it took two and a half years the way yeah. that he built it, and um, yeah, I, I was fascinated by it when I saw it, so I thought. It, yeah. Can we get it out there? And I'm very excited about seeing uh, when he's going to make the platform available to others to use. Well, what's going to come out of that? Because that's uh, that's going to be super interesting as well. Uh, and so you know, uh, just uh, moving on from uh, the book of Sarth, you know, Sneak Attack works on a variety of different projects. So wh when did the company start out? Uh, just just as an introduction. Um, the company started 2006. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sort of working in this space, especially, or you know, did you did you dabble in a few different things beforehand? Um, it started out as a digital marketing company, which meant something totally different than it does now. We did a lot yeah. of we still we started out doing a lot of you know blog pitching and online PR and and things like that. And our, our relationships were based in in online PR, but then it was all about MySpace. It was all about you know contesting and things like that. So. Yeah. It's evolved so much from then because so much has changed. You know, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter. You know, we had like the very starting beginnings of Twitter, um, and um, there wasn't really much to do on it. And now it's like, you know, just such a staple in what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sheer volume of platforms and and where we can go with different things. It was it was Yahoo, MySpace, Napster. You know, <laughs> 
trying to get people to buy stuff when they found it for free and yeah. and it's still kind of like that but in a different way in a different way in a very different way so uh, you know one of the campaigns that you that you've uh, sort of uh, helped out recently and, and and that has actually gained a lot of traction this week especially with features from uh uh, I think the New York Times and, and Billboard and you know picked up by a variety of different uh, music tech uh, press is the Ghost Ghost Beach experiment. So uh, can you can you talk us a to us a little bit about what that is in case people haven't heard of what they what they've been doing? Yeah. Um, so Ghost Beach um, is a band from from here in New York from Brooklyn and um, they're a duo. They um, they had a, a sync placement with their song Miracle um, in a an American Eagle um, ad and um, online, and they uh, went to went to the agency that 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 kind of set it up and said, "What else can we do? You know, this is great, thank you, but what else can we do?" And the the agency came back with the idea of giving them some billboard space, um, uh, you know, from American Eagle in Times Square, just. Massive, and so um, it was the band's idea to not just say we've got an album out or this is going on with us, um, but to use it in some really creative way to start a discussion. Yeah. And so um, they chose to do this artists uh, artists versus artists kind of artists for piracy, artists against piracy campaign, where they developed two hashtags: one's artists for piracy, one's artists against piracy, and they let people weigh in on both sides. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing is, is they're not, they are against piracy, but, and they realize, and they've done tons of interviews in the past few weeks about this, but um, they just wanted to open it up for discussion. They realized that, you know, they've given away a lot of their music for free because they were just starting out and they wanted to get people to, you know, start talking about them and listening to them and then have something. Now they just finally released a, a remix record that's out now. Um, but they wanted to start a discussion. They just wanted to see what people thought about it. It wasn't about, you know, they thought that them giving away music for free was piracy, but they they wanted people to talk, and they, they did. Yeah. So it was really, really cool. And I, I like the the fact that they kept it very simple because, of course, of course, it it, it was prone to it was, it was prone to driving misinterpretations. But you know, people could basically take the campaign as they wished they could interpret it in, in a variety of different ways they could be angry about it they could they could like it you know there, there were so many ways to take this uh, to take this approach and what what i liked was the fact that you know piracy has so many definitions as well as a word and different people think of different things when they think of what piracy is and and you know of course if you if you Think of piracy as as you know the early days you know and, and you know still ongoing piracy of, of actually getting music that is available commercially for free without any consideration for the artist of course you know most people would be against that but then if with piracy you also include artists that do give the music away for free and they want to then that, that becomes a whole different conversation and, and it's it's a, it's a very interesting approach um so uh just in terms of uh you know how do you think this will impact the the music itself because of course the band is, is a working band and they have a release out and of, uh, at the end of the website actually there's actually a link uh, uh, and if you choose artists for piracy uh, then you, you you get to download or you can choose to download the album for free or if you choose artists against piracy you can choose to buy the album uh, so uh, uh, how do you think this can impact uh, the band's the band's release and, and, the, and the campaign around that um well i mean i think it, it's interesting because the whole point of it is to to spark conversation and the band was very clear that they didn't want to make it about them um, and they wanted you know obviously they knew that it would pick up some you know it would start a conversation about them and more people would hear the music and that's that's what happened you know people have um, checked out the music because they're curious because um, you know who is this band behind all of this and why haven't I heard about them before and then at that point the music speaks for itself so someone's checking out the music because they're curious and they're either gonna like it or they not they're not and um, you know, the music's really good, so they like it, and, and people have been talking about it a lot, which is great. So people have been talking about them in conjunction with this campaign, but then they've also been talking about them and their music a lot, which is what we're, what we've been focusing on. So it's a good, um, it's a good compliment to, yeah. to the record being out and, you know, them working on other stuff and, you know, having displayed South by and, and things like that. So it's been really nice. That's great, absolutely, and it kind of it underlines uh, that the importance of when you are working with a brand or when you do get 
something from a brand that you wouldn't uh, or you know uh, that you wouldn't have otherwise expected to get or something that is is interesting to actually try to make the most out of it rather than just taking it on face value and 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 doing the same old thing that everybody else would make because if they had like you mentioned you know just put a, a banner up saying you know our album is out uh, you know we wouldn't be talking about that right now so of course uh, of right. course it's always important to to try and try and find something interesting and new to to put in front of people's eyes and make them think about about different issues i guess uh, so uh, another another campaign that was uh, there's another a couple of things that that you that you've been working on uh, one, one other band that you worked with is uh, the Black Angels uh, so uh, you've done an interesting work with the Pitchfork Advance which is you know the the part of Pitchfork where they they preview albums that are about to come out uh, and and that was uh, tied in with Instagram so can you can you explain a little bit about uh, how that uh, idea came about and how how you implemented it yeah, um, I mean, we were basically, we found out that they were going to have this opportunity on Pitchfork and, um, you know, we were talking about different ways that we can make it different because, uh, you know, we just wanted to stand out a bit and the Black Angels have some amazing fans and a lot of them are very artistic and so we came up with the idea of involving Instagram because people are going to take pictures of things anyway, people are going to be inspired by the music um, and so we had the idea of why don't we let the fans um, submit their images for the artwork that's going to be used in the Pitchfork Bands. Obviously the artwork for the packaging was already made, yeah. but we we're going to do um, lyric artwork anyway. The label was going to put that together, The Orchard um, was going to put that together, So and, and the band's management as well. So we thought, well, why don't we just have the fans submit their photos and the band can choose some, but why don't we make it you know, interactive where they can use Instagram to, to submit the photos. So we just chose the simple hashtag Indigo Meadow because that was that's the name of the album, and um, we didn't want to make it too specific so that it could it could take on a life of its own after the campaign, which it has. And now there's tons of interesting photos on um, floating around Instagram with that hashtag, which is great. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it was really amazing. We got a lot of submissions. A lot of them were just really beautiful. Um, you know, it was a lot of what you know you you think well, what's what's indigo meadow what is that to people and, and we got so many different interpretations of what that could mean um and the band chose 13 of them one for each song and then they created these really beautiful lyric uh images slides with the lyrics from the songs and then the, uh, the images from the fans and it was a very unique thing because i don't think that um anyone's ever sourced imagery from the fans for this particular feature yeah. um, and then you know it ended up being one of the most shared items on Pitchfork that week which you know you could I don't know if it was because of the record because the record's amazing or if it was sharing it because their artwork is featured but or a combination of the two yeah so um might have been, yeah it's just a really interesting thing to see all these people getting involved and sharing so I, I, I like this uh, sort of running theme that that we're seeing, uh, of course, with with Sarth and uh, uh, with uh, Black Angels, uh, and, and in, in a way also with Ghost Beach, in the sense that the design of the of of the artists uh, for and, and against piracy was very striking and you know very, very well designed. So it's sort of an association of music and imagery, and it's also something that we've we've seen more and more of. Uh, for example, with uh, SoundCloud's new premium uh, sort of brand partner uh, feature that's that came out. Uh, Last month, uh, where you know there's images that are actually running alongside the the, the sounds for selected partners at the moment. It's it's, it's a beta feature, but uh, but I can see it catching on for for premium users as well. So so do you see that as a sort of a running theme of of uh, associating music with visuals, making a more powerful statement on, on on what's going on? I do, but I think it's been something that's been happening forever. I think art and music has always gone hand in hand, and you know, it's been two things that complement each other. One springs from another. You know, you hear artists talking about, "I was listening to this when I was painting this," or "I was, you know, looking at this while I was making this record." So, I think that it's a natural symbiosis, and I also think that now more than ever, people are craving the imagery with it because we don't have necessarily like the package to t take home and look at, oh, this is so beautiful, and look at the lyrics. And I think that's why people are finding it, they're craving that. They want that visual. You know, they don't want to just put it on, like, you know, on their computer, or listen to it, or stream it off their phone. They want something else, you know. And I think that's, art and imagery is probably the most, the closest we can come to something tangible um, with, with, with something digital. So, yeah, I hope 
hope it happens more. I hope that, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons also people are buying so much vinyl. Yeah. You know, it's something they can hold and it's, you know, it's beautiful and there's usually some sort of, you know, extra art involved. So it's, I think that's a good sign. I think yeah. that's really good. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as you said, you know, it's always been an association there, but it, I guess it has been relatively under you know, underused just because, you know, people are so used now to, you know, MP3s and, 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 and streaming sites not really featuring anything else other than the, the album artwork. And so, you know, it's, it's a matter of bringing this association back into the forefront and making it really available to people to, for people to, to consume. I mean, I, I would love to see some more artworks or slides being available on Spotify or any other platform of, of that kind, if that was possible. Yes, like the lyrics or, you know, some kind of um, extra added artwork and um, yeah and, and photos visual. yeah that would be great uh, well yeah. it was awesome talking to you and uh, you know i would just point everybody to is this sneakattackmedia.com the website mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that's right and you can check out all their other projects they have a, a ton of really great stuff uh, uh, i checked out a fantastic app with uh, with an artist okay would you remind me the name sorry uh, yeah. yeah the app we also do music stuff too the app is called art intelligence yeah and um it's an ipad app for um various visual artists. The one that's out now is for the sculptor Patricia Piccinini. Yeah, that's right. And then the next one that's coming out is for Keith Haring. So we're really excited about that. Yeah, and that's that's a fantastic visual experience. And and I've got, I've got artists in the family, so uh, very excited about that one. And well, thanks yeah. so much for your time. It's great having you on. Thanks for having me. This is really great. And the Digital Music Trends also has a weekly music news show. You can find it by heading to digitalmusictrends.com.